My name is Eric Basmajan. Uh, I'm the founder of EPB Macro Research, research company specializing in long-term and short-term economic cycle research. Uh, my background is in economics. I studied at New York University. Uh, I went to the buy side and worked at a quantitative hedge fund specializing in equity derivatives after school. Uh, and after a couple of years there, I left to pursue uh, more of my macro background uh, in economic research. And what I do at uh, EPB Macro Research that's different is I combined secular and cyclical economic trends. We see a lot of people that focus on long-term economic trends and they do really great research. A lot of other people focus on shorter term trends, you know, what to do over the next couple of months. I try and marry the two and create uh, actionable uh, ideas and portfolio structure for investors that marries both long term secular trends, which to me is anything uh, three to five years plus, and then cyclical economic trends, which is in the six to 18 month window. In the six to 18 month window, we see asset prices are extremely correlated to the rate of change in economic growth and inflation. So that would be the, the, uh, the direction of growth and inflation. Um, so that's mainly what I do. And um, uh, the, the long-term secular trends are mainly uh, derived from demographics and uh, debt levels impacting productivity. So that's the basic framework that I use. Eric, what is your long-term thesis? What are diff different inputs? You mentioned uh, uh, demographics and, and growth. And you know, what are you sort of yielding for, for your long-term insights? So over the long-term, growth and inflation are gonna continue to grind lower. Uh, over the long-term, growth is a function of population and productivity. Demographically, the country is having a lower rate of population growth and the demographics are getting older. That's going to reduce the long-term rate of economic growth, reduce the rate of long-term inflation. That's going to put persistent downward pressure on bond yields over the long term, over the three to five year window. Over the shorter term, six to 18 month window, what we're seeing is we're seeing rising inflation early in an economic cycle, damaging real incomes. The damage to real incomes is, is causing a cyclical downturn in the consumption of durable goods now that prices have risen too much. So I expect that cyclical downturn in the rate of uh, production and consumption to continue. And as a result, I think that the Federal Reserve is going to tighten policy into slowing economic growth, which could create volatility for risk assets and even more downward pressure on long-term rates. My, my long-term view is that both the, the rate of growth and inflation are going to be coming down because of a declining population in terms of the growth rate and aging demographics. So the population growth rate is falling and the demographics are getting older. And then also aggregate debt levels in terms of debt to GDP are going to be reducing productivity. So when you combine uh, worsening demographics with higher debt levels, over the long term, the growth rate and inflation rate are going to come down, and that's going to put persistent downward pressure on long-term interest rates and interest rates across the entire curve as it makes it very difficult for the Federal Reserve to raise interest rates. In the shorter term, when we're looking in the 6- to 18-month window, what I'm looking at is the growth rate in various coincident economic indicators like employment, production, income, and consumption. And what we see there is we see the real growth rate uh, accelerated through March of this year. The growth rate peaked and it's come down every single month in real terms since that March 2021 peak. On the inflation side, uh, we had a report uh, that came out this morning that showed that inflation continues to rise based on the way I measure it, which is a, a shorter term six month growth rate. We actually had the inflation rate rise to 7.1%, which was the highest level in over 40 years. So we have declining growth for the short term. We still have rising inflation. Uh, as we move into 2022, I would expect that inflation rate to come down, but I don't expect the growth rate to materially increase either. Uh, we're recording this on November the 10th, and the uh, inflation uh, ran very hot at 6.2% yearly for the month of October, which is at a 30-year high. You know, people were, were calling for that inflation would be transitory in April. Uh, what do you think uh, happened that... Uh, sort of that thesis didn't work out yet? So I think that the supply chain issues have been um, longer lasting and more intense than most people have anticipated, including myself. Um, however, I, would be, um, I wouldn't be quick to blame this on fiscal policy or monetary policy because this is quite a global phenomenon. We're seeing rising inflation in basically every country, uh, sort of irrespective of their COVID response. 
basically a lot of this inflation is because of shortages of goods. You know, we see this morning, uh, COVID cases in Germany are rising to new highs again. So are they going to have a response there? Is that going to further delay uh, easing of supply chain pressures? A lot of this stuff is, is very unpredictable uh, and has a lot to do with policy response. As far as the inflation report and what's been driving the bulk of the inflation, to me, I'm really watching durable goods inflation. And within the durable goods sector is things like used cars, which has been uh, the dominant factor, in my opinion, which is uh, driving inflation higher. So I mentioned that I like to measure any of these economic data points. Uh, rather than year over year, I use a, a little bit more of a timely measure. It's called the smooth six-month annualized growth rate. So it'll move a little bit faster than a year over year calculation. And the durable goods inflation rate peaked in June based on this growth rate measure at about 20% annualized. Uh, it came down to about 14%. And then this last report, it popped back to 16% because again, used car prices were the dominant factor. So the, the peak rate of durable goods inflation was in June, but offsetting that decline has been a rise in rent inflation, which we uh, have expected because of the increase in home prices. And one of the comments that I've been liking to make about inflation is everyone's sort of pointing to rent inflation and they sort of have this lead of home prices and then rent inflation and say then therefore CPI is going to rise. But we have to be careful when we do that because uh, while rent inflation very well may increase in the direction of home prices, that's only one factor in the CPI report. And it is 33%, so it is a big factor, but there's still 70% of the report that's not rent inflation that we have to consider. So if you look at durable goods inflation, if uh, durable goods inflation spent most of the last 15 years in deflation as the price of goods has, has come down. So even if prices hold steady, uh, then the growth rate's going to come back to zero. And when we're looking at the overall impact to CPI, durable goods inflation will be going from 20% to zero, while rent inflation may be rising from 3% to 7 or 8 and when you adjust them based on the volatility and the weightings, they have an equal impact on the CPI. Eric, you've really been uh, following so much economic data. Can you go over your six to 18th month models, uh, industrial production, non-farm payrolls, real consumption, and adjusted real income, and show the sort of stalling uh, that you may see? Yeah, so I'll, I'll walk through my framework quickly. So what I like to do is when I look at the six to 18 month window, I'm looking at is growth is growth uh, increasing or is growth decreasing? And in the chart, I have a four panel chart that shows the four corners of the economy that I like to call it, which you mentioned. And then I also combine those four into what I call a coincident economic index, which gives me an objective read of the direction of growth right here and right now. It's not a leading indicator. It doesn't tell me where growth's gonna be uh, six months from now. It just tells me what's happened as of the la latest data. And, that, and, and those four data points are are big, they're broad, and they cover all sectors of the economy. Then what I'll do is I'll look at what I call longer leading economic indicators and shorter leading economic indicators because I'd like to get an idea of where that growth rate is heading because that's where you really get your edge. Are you gonna be ahead of the market and forecasting an increase or decrease in the growth rate? So if I look at the chart of the four factor coincident index, what we see is the growth rate accelerated so the growth rate was increasing through March. It peaked and then the growth rate's been coming down basically every month since then. So then what I would do is I would look at my longer leading economic indicators. You can look at things like the, the housing market it tends to be a longer leading indicator because it's sensitive to interest rates. It's a big ticket item. There's a high multiplier effect to people buying houses. And we see most of the housing data because of this big demographic shift peaked in January, February of 2021. Uh, there's been some fits and starts along the way but housing data broadly peaked in January and the, and the growth rate's been coming down. That would be one thing to look at from a longer leading perspective. So if there's no real reason to expect an upturn in longer leading data, then we should be aware for, for shorter leading data to continue moving to the downside. Shorter leading data would be things like uh, capital goods, new orders, uh, things like that, that. A lot of people track, but one thing I would, I would note is that we have to be careful of data that's reported in nominal dollars and data that's reported in real dollars. So we see a lot of charts of, of capital goods new orders going straight up and everyone's saying that there's this revival in capital spending, but that's reported in nominal dollars and you have to deflate that by the PPI index. So really this chart that's going up is just capturing a rise in the PPI index. It's not capturing any real advancement in capital goods spending. 
when you deflate it and you look at real capital goods new orders, that growth rate's been coming down since uh, basically uh, December, January of, of this year as well. So if I look at my longer leading data, I look at my shorter leading data, there's no reason for me to believe that in the next six to 18 months, we're gonna have a material acceleration in those four factors, in those four coincident data points. So as a result of that, I would be positioned for a cyclical decline in the rate of uh, economic growth. So what does that mean in terms of uh, asset markets? Generally, when economic growth is declining, we can measure these cycles going back as far as we have data. And over the last 25 years, just to give everybody some context, cyclical upturns, so when the growth rate's increasing, tends to last about 1.1 years on average. These downturns in growth tend to last about 1.5 years on average. They don't always end in recession. Sometimes you have a soft landing and you start to reaccelerate. But the growth rate peaked in March, so if we're using 1.5 years as our rough timetable, it would be it would be on the earlier side for growth to inflect uh, right now. So there's no reason to believe growth can accelerate. And when we look back at these cycles, we see that a decline in growth tends to correlate with lower bond yields. That's been happening since since March. You know, the growth rate of the economy peaked in March. Bond yields peaked exactly in March. Uh, Long-term bond yields. So that's fairly consistent. We've also seen. Uh, the Russell 2000 you know, trend mostly sideways since March. It hit a new high recently. Uh, so that's also pretty consistent. And then I've also seen strength in the U.S. dollar relative to the more cyclical currencies like the Australian dollar, the Canadian dollar, uh, the, the Brazilian real, uh, which is also consistent with growth slowing. So uh, when growth slowing, you want to be more defensive. You want to be on the lookout for more volatility. And then we have the Fed uh, gearing up to tighten policy into that slowing growth, which should cause more volatility as well. Uh, Eric, so does that mean that you expect bond yields to decline from here until the summer of next year, 2022? So I don't, I don't try and uh, time the inflections to the average, uh, the average growth. I just sort of like to give some context. So I won't make my pivot until I see an inflection in the longer leading and shorter leading data which should give me an advanced warning that this data is going to start to inflect higher. So as of right now, there's nothing on the horizon that would suggest to me in the next couple of months we're going to see a major acceleration. So I would be sticking with the forecast that long-term bond yields are going to continue to decline against that March peak. Eric, so that's your framework, that when growth is slowing, bond yields decline. When growth is accelerating, bond yields rise. Another framework I'm sure you're familiar with is that essentially – Bonds are inflation bloodhounds. They sniff out uh, when inflation is going to happen because uh, inflation is anathema to to bonds. Inflation destroys the value of bonds because bonds pay a certain fixed coupon that's denominated in dollars and fiat, if you you will. And if that fiat is being uh, depreciated by inflation at 6.2% a year, as we saw in October, then you'd have to charge at least 6.2%. Otherwise, you're losing money. So um, if you take the, quote, real yield, if you subtract... Uh, the current uh, year-over-year CPI, consumer price index inflation rate, minus the 10-year treasury yield, you get deeply negative real yields. Uh, and then, of course, there's the tips yields, which is actually not what inflation actually is, but what the market is forecasting for, for 10 years. So the fact that inflation has been so high, why do you think the bond market has been so willing to forgive the extremely high, you know, 30-year high uh, consumer price index, which you know really are remarkable readings? Is it that they're forecasting that uh, decline in inflation? Um, or is it that they simply don't care that inflation is high, that we're in, a, we're in a new world? In the same way that you know bond investors who thought that buying negative yielding nominal European bonds in 2014, they thought that was crazy, but it turned out that we were in a new regime. Uh, are we in a new reg- regime or, or not? I think you make uh, excellent points on both of those, and I'll, and I'll answer yes to both of them. So you made the distinction between the, the uh, short-term year-over-year rate of inflation and the longer-term uh, derived inflation expectations from the tips market. So uh, the, the long-term uh, inflation expectations in the tips market is quite a bit lower than the 6 or 7% that we're seeing on these annual readings. Um, but it's still quite elevated relative to the last couple of years. Uh, so the, the bond market is forecasting a little bit higher inflation than we're used to uh, over the last 10 years, but it is quite a bit lower than, than where we are. So the market's generally if I was to put it in one sentence, expecting that inflation is going to come down over the next couple of years, but it may stick at a higher level than it was prior to uh, prior to COVID. Um, what that means is that bond investors will accept a lower real yield, uh, 
Uh, but to your point, we are sort of in a new world because uh, inflation expectations will be tethered to the long-term rate of inflation and real yields will be tethered to the, the long-term rate of real economic growth. And going back to the structural or secular economic framework that we talked about uh, a little bit earlier, we should be expecting this rate of growth in the economy to continue grinding lower and lower and lower with really uh, the zero bound not holding much of a floor. That may not be a three-year forecast or a five-year forecast, but if we're looking out to you know, 10, 15, 20 years, there's pretty serious uh, demographic uh, pulls that are going to be pulling the real growth rate lower and lower and lower. So one way to think about um, investing in bonds is, is that the real return on bonds would be your, uh, the, the rate that you would get for a risk-free investment. And if the real GDP growth rate in the economy grinds to, let's say, 0.5%, what we can say is that an investment in the actual economy, on average, will yield you 0.5%. That would be the average real growth rate in the economy. But there's economic risk associated with that. So if you're looking for a risk-free alternative, you'd have to be willing to accept a lower rate than that. So if the growth rate in the economy is going to continue to grind down, if we're going to, if we're going to uh, drop below 1%, drop below 0.5%, and we're going to start to grind towards a 0% growth environment, then bond investors will accept uh, lower real yields on a, on a longer term basis uh, under the assumption that interest rates will continue to grind down. The second point that I would make is that one way to think about long-term bonds is that uh, a 30-year bond, uh, for example, could be the average expected Fed funds rate over the life of that bond. So even though we have extremely high inflation, we also have extraordinarily high debt levels, both public and private sector debt. So as inflation heats up and the short-term interest rates rise, expecting rate hikes, the long-term rates are coming down and it's flattening the yield curve. That flattening of the yield curve will put pressure on the economy, and it's going to make it even more difficult for the Fed to sort of hike the interest rates to meet the level of inflation without inverting the curve and pushing the economy into a recession. So the long-term bond yields are basically saying that we're going to hang out here at a low level. Uh, inflation is going to rise. You can try and, and raise the front-end rates. But pretty quickly, you're going to have to come and drop those rates back to zero because the structural forces in the economy are just way too strong and it's going to pull the Fed funds rate back down. And when you go 10, 15, 20 years, the average Fed funds rate is not really going to be all that much off the zero bound. So my only point in, in, in making this uh, distinction between rent inflation and durables inflation is that we have to look at the whole pie. We can't just look at one component of inflation to forecast the rest of it. Uh, the other thing that I would point out, and I have a bunch of slides to, to, uh, to cover this, is the impact that this inflation is having on real income. So real income, we can look at it various different ways. We can look at what's called real disposable income per capita. Uh, real disposable income is probably the best measure of income in the entire economy. It takes basically income from all sources, uh, and it nets out taxes, so it's what's left after you pay taxes in real terms. It includes all the government transfer payments that were sent out in the early part of uh, the pandemic. It includes Social Security, Medicare, uh, unemployment insurance, as well as the stimulus checks. So we saw real disposable income per capita spike massively a couple times, coinciding with the various stimulus checks that were sent out. But if we plot real disposable income relative to the pre-COVID trend, the trend was already pretty weak the last economic cycle. It was only 1.8%. But even after these stimulus payments have faded, we're falling below that trend line, which means that over the last 12 years since 2009, inclusive of all these government transfer payments, real incomes have not grown above 1.8%. And the reason that that's important is because with an economy that's tethered to consumption, it's very difficult for real GDP growth to deviate from real income growth. So when we're looking at you know, why has real, income, uh, real GDP growth have, has uh, so low over the last 10 years, we have to look no further than real incomes being very depressed.
Yeah, so real income is important. There's income growth, but if incomes grow at 6% and inflation grows at 7%, net net, uh, workers are actually losing 1%, and that could be a contractionary force. Uh, exactly my right. question for you, Eric, is on that chart, which we just put up, the sharp decline, is would that have anything to do with the uh, expiration of fiscal stimulus, particularly uh, the expansion of unemployment programs? And does the persistent... Uh, you know, huge amount of jobs in the, the jolts numbers, the number of jobs that are available to workers, which now exceeds the numbers of uh, unemployed persons by a considerable d degree. D do you see that as a as a as a, a sort of petri dish for a tight uh, labor market that will uh, sort of necessarily be good for workers and, and increase wages? And if not, why not? So those are all really good questions. So those those big spikes that we see in the chart correlate to the various stimulus payments, and then. Uh, we saw that the it fall basically right back to the trend line. And then there was this battle where some analysts thought that child tax credits were going to come in and bolster real incomes or incomes. And um, other analysts thought that as unemployment benefits expired, jobs would and, and wages would, would replace that lost income. It's turning out that um, that's not the case. The real incomes are falling as these stimulus payments have we uh, been wearing off and the economy hasn't been able to replace those incomes organically. The chart that you could show uh, that I brought in the, in the deck that I sent you is called Real Personal Income Excluding Transfer Payments. So this is, takes all the income in the economy, it just excludes everything that comes from the government, which excludes Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and all of the other transfer payments. The gap in real income excluding government transfer payments is widening at an alarming rate. There's been really no growth in the last 18 months, which shows that the actual economy is really struggling to boost real incomes and the government needs to come in and try and fill that hole. But even with all the governmental support that we've had, it's still not keeping real income above the trend of the pre-COVID expansion. To your point about the labor market, there's been, uh, the JOLTS numbers have been off the charts the last few jobs reports showed a cyclical acceleration. But the one thing that's been very stubborn to increase is the labor force participation rate and the employment to population ratio. So when we look at the labor force participation rate, even for prime age workers, so 25 to 54, sort of taking away that demographic argument, we're seeing that the labor force participation rate is not all that much higher, if at all, than it was in the initial bounce in August 2020. You know, we went into a big lockdown in March, April. So the economy sort of opened over the summer in 2020. And the labor force participation rate's not all that much higher than it was in August of 2020. So there's a real question here about what's going on. Why is the labor force participation rate so depressed? And what does that mean structurally for the economy? So if you look at, uh, you know, the unemployment rate, it shows that it's coming down quite substantially. But if you use the labor force participation rate, it shows that the labor market is still extremely impaired. And um, from a structural sense, labor force participation rate and the employment to population ratio are much more correlated with uh, real wage gains than, than the unemployment rate, which takes away a lot of workers that are not in the labor force. So I would be reluctant to call the labor market incredibly hot while we have this really structural decline going on in the labor force participation rate, which we can get into uh, some of the anecdotal evidence and some reports suggesting that, that daycare capacity may be behind some of the reluctance of uh, parents with small children to return to the labor force. But uh, regardless of the reason, we're having trouble basically getting back to the same labor force participation rate that we had prior to COVID. And the, the aggregate number of jobs in the economy is still several million less. So there's still quite a bit of wood to chop, unless you believe that the economy can function uh, as it was prior to COVID with several million fewer payrolls. I, uh, I want to propose a theory which you may disagree with, which is that the economy can function without those millions of payrolls but it is just a more inflationary environment. It, it, to me, Eric, it seems like the correlation between a uh, low uh, labor force participation rate and wages should be actually, let me see if I get this right, um, negative. In, in, in other words, if, if there aren't a lot of, if, if the labor participation rate uh, shrinks, that means that the market clearing price for labor is too low and that wages have to go up in order to attract workers back into the economy. Do you disagree with this? And you know, if so, why? You make a really good point. And uh, Chairman Powell actually talked about this in one of his press conferences 
maybe two or three press conferences ago when we were talking about um, the hiking cycle of 2000. Uh, 17, 18, and why there was um, such difficulty for wage gains in the prior economic cycle, despite what was also a depressed labor force participation rate and employment to population ratio. And what Chairman Powell said, which which I would agree with, is that um, if people are leaving the labor force for wage reasons, as soon as those wages rise to a level that make those people excited, they would re-enter the labor force, and which which keeps the wages at a level that would, would otherwise cause them to keep rising. So if the labor force participation rate is really depressed right now and wages, uh, the offering wage jumps substantially above inflation, we'd likely see those people that are not in the labor force enter the labor force and increase the available pool of labor. So when we look at the employment to population ratio or the labor force, my preferred is the employment to population ratio. That's really the critical measure of how much available labor is there, whether it's in the labor force or not, how much available labor is in the economy, and that available labor will enter if the wages rise to enough of a level, which will prevent sort of a spiral from going up. So it's not as tight as a market as I think some of the uh, more conventional measures suggest. So you, you, you made a good point about how the economy may be able to function with less people. And that could be translated to productivity gains, right? So GDP per worker, we're able to produce more GDP with less workers. That's, that's great in some sense, but then we have a larger societal question of if we have an increasing number of people that are not in the labor force, which the last time I looked at the, the measure, I believe it's over 100 million people that are not in the labor force. As a societal question, we'll have to ask what, uh, what will these people uh, what will these people do and how will we take care of these people in terms of having them fed, having them not be homeless and things like that. And generally what ends up happening is that the government steps in to provide support to these people that don't have jobs or an economy that's been structured in a way where a lot of jobs have been exported so there's not as much opportunity. So basically what happens is the government comes in to support these people that are not in the labor force through transfer payments. And those transfer payments tend to be debt financed or debt based. We're basically borrowing money for, for these transfer payments, which increases the size of government spending relative to GDP, which has negative economic consequences. So uh, the, the basically trying to, uh, trying to soften the blow of having a large percentage of the population that's not in the labor force through debt financed fiscal transfers also has a deleterious effect to the economy. So we have to be mindful of that as well. Would you say though in the short term it's, it's positive because we've had a you know, debt financed fiscal program uh, b both under Trump and under Biden, and we ha ha that has coincided with inflation. You know, I can't say that causes inflation, but it, uh, a lot of people generally accepted that. Like the, you know, if you give uh, people a certain amount of money a week, and that is larger than the amount that they were, would would earn uh, if they were going to go to work, that 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 is inflationary. You're, do you? Uh, you're saying it's long-term disinflationary, but do you think it's short-term inflationary, or even on the short term, you think it's disinflationary? No, it could absolutely have a short-term. Uh, boost to both growth and inflation. Uh, most of the academic research suggests, however, that that benefit fades entirely after three years. But as the economies become more and more indebted, we're triggering diminishing returns, which means that these debt finance fiscal packages are lasting shorter and shorter and shorter. So if you remember, we had the Trump tax cuts, which was a huge debt finance fiscal transfer uh, in uh, Q4 of 2017 sort of kind of hit the economy in Q1 of 2018. And by 2019, we were cutting interest rates already because the economy was slowing so substantially. Uh, we sent out a uh, major fiscal stimulus in March of this year, March of 2021. And real final sales, uh, which is GDP minus inventory, was negative in Q3 already. So it didn't even last one quarter. Uh, so we have to be sensitive to just how fast the, the spurt and then the, the uh, retracement is getting with these debt finance packages. Most of the evidence now is suggesting that we'd be lucky if these, uh, these blasts are lasting more than two quarters. Most of the evidence is less than two quarters. But to your point, yes, it can cause a short-term boost. Eric, key to your long-term secular view is that demographics will pull growth down, they'll yank bond yields down. Can you explain why that's the case? And perhaps you can use an example of what's been going on in Japan and Europe 
in my uh, sort of simple framework, if I think about it using common sense, uh, if there are a lot of elderly people and not a lot of workers, that should you know be mean a tight labor market which should rise wages so it should be inflationary but in fact that common sense is wrong what we've seen is that uh an aging of the of, of the population is uh extremely deflationary why is that the case and you know what do you see in united states will we go the way of japan and, and europe so the the demographic estimates are fairly reliable because you know, population trends are, are pretty slow moving. So we can have a, a pretty high degree of certainty on the direction that we're going to be moving. And the population growth rate is coming down and the population is getting older. So the reason that an aging population has a negative impact on growth is because there's sort of a sort of a bell curve with your consumption trends. So as you move uh, from uh, an adolescent through your 20s into your 40s, and in the uh, 44 to 55 year old bracket is when your consumption tends to peak. And then after 55, your consumption tends to tail off. And then when you're maybe in the 80 to 90 range, it kind of ticks up a little bit because there's a lot of healthcare consumption. But basically your consumption is on the backside of that, of that sine curve when, you, when you're older than 55 generally. Even more interesting is that uh, housing consumption tends to peak in the slightly earlier cohort. So housing consumption tends to peak roughly in the 40-year-old bracket. So once you get a population that's, that's uh, 60 plus, they're generally in the home that they're going to be in. They're not going to consume a new home. And the, the reason that this is important and, and the reason I would um, slightly disagree with the characterization that less labor means higher wages and higher inflation is because you know, again, wages are just one, one piece of the puzzle, but also is we need to think about the economic engine. And the economic engine is we need consumption, we need production, we need employment, and we need income. And if you're 65 plus and you're leaving the labor force, well, you're not producing anything anymore, you're not earning anything anymore other than maybe off of your assets, and you're just going to uh, consume, but you're going to consume at a lesser rate. As the population ages, the growth rate's going to come down. But there's another factor that's, uh, that's contributing to a, a structural decline in the developed economies is that most economies like Europe and the United States are set up where once you turn 65, you're the beneficiary of pretty serious transfer payments in the form of Social Security and, and Medicare as well. So as the population gets older, it tends to also increase the debt burden on societies as well. It makes it easier for older age workers to leave the labor force, perhaps before their bodies you know, require them to leave the labor force, just because they're cushioned with transfer payments uh, that, that we have set up. So it creates a system where we have transfer payments going towards the older demographics, those that tend to have most of the assets, and we're doing it in a way that's increasing debt which causes uh, those resources to be pulled from the, uh, the prime age cohort, which is who we need to consume and produce. Uh, the, the, the chart that you could show on this is, is what's called the age dependency ratio. And I graphed it inversely in the chart. And basically what this shows is, it shows the proportion of young, so 14 and under and 65 and older, as a percentage of the working age population. So you take the very young, the very old, and divide it by the people in the middle. And that tends to show how much of a burden there is on the working age population to support both the young people and the old people through uh, transfer payments or through raising kids and diverting resources to, to, to them. So what we see is that, uh, you know, doing a little bit of history here, when we go back to uh, World War II, at the end of the war, everyone's very familiar with the baby boom. Everyone at the end of the 40s came home, they had tons of kids. We see the population spike. If you fast forward 20 years, that brings us to the 1960s or the late 1960s, which is where this, this demographic chart that I'm referencing bottomed. And then from 1960 to 1980, the country had the most positive demographics that we're probably ever going to see because that baby boom generation was coming of age. They were all hitting 25 to 50, uh, the, really the 25 year old bracket, and they were hitting the accelerating part of their consumption curve. On top of that, in the 70s, the, global, uh, the, the economy was very lightly indebted, only about 150% aggregate debt to GDP versus close to 400 today. 
So you had a massive rising share of the 25 year old cohort in a very lightly indebted economy, which caused, uh, in my opinion, was the driving force behind most of the uh, sticky inflation in the 70s and 80s decade. And I have a couple of charts which show the, the longer term change, the 20 year change in this age dependency ratio and these uh, longer term trends in inflation. So that's sort of the quick answer of, of why I believe that the demographics will pull the growth rate lower. And I have another chart which uh, shows this across every country with a population over 60 million. So there's, you know, maybe 10 or 15 uh, countries in there, all of them except for China, which we, you know, can roughly guess that they're slightly overstating their growth numbers. So they're above the projected curve, but everywhere else fits pretty tightly around the curve, uh, especially as you get to the 65 and older being 15% or more of the population. So uh, there's pretty strong evidence to suggest that as the population ages, as we get a little bit older, that's going to pull the growth rate in the economy lower. Yeah, and historically, emerging markets are thought to have good demographics. Although I would note, China is a is the biggest component of most emerging market stock market indices, and I believe um, that China actually has very bad demographics. Not now, but going forward, because there are so many more men than women. Um, I think that that you know it's it's among the worst in terms of the rate of change. So, Eric, thank you for uh, laying that out. The relationship between a high percentage of uh, folks not in the workforce and low growth rate, low inflation rate. But I also note that low bond yields, because uh, what do old people you know, do? They, they own assets, a lot of assets. Like I, I, I learned a fantastic uh, uh, um, uh, statistic the other day, which is that the silent generation in America owns more assets than uh, millennials by a factor of something like uh, two or three. So and they own bonds because they have to be uh, risk averse. And that drives bond yields lower. So Eric, my question is, in this world of negative real yields, what's the play? If you expect the negative real yields to continue to be negative, continue to go lower, the most obvious trade is buy tips, treasury inflation protected securities. You could also, people are buying gold, people are buying Bitcoin. I mean, gold historically traded inversely with negative real rates, but over the past year, it's been a tremendous disappointment. What's your thought about that? And then what's your also thought about uh, Bitcoin? Sure. So my my overall portfolio framework is, is I like to to approach the world with, a, with a, the most balanced portfolio that I could come up with. And uh, a very simplistic representation of that is the all-weather portfolio, which was made popular by Ray Dalio. It's got a pretty healthy balance between stocks, bonds, gold, and commodities. And they're weighted based on their volatility so that if you approach the world with that portfolio, you're pretty well covered for whichever way the world moves in terms of growth, inflation, deflation, recession. One of those assets or a combination will perform well. Then what I like to do is I like to take the secular trends and the cyclical trends, and I like to overweight or underweight the assets that are likely to perform well in that environment. So the secular trend that I have, that the rate of growth is going to continue to decline and the rate of inflation is going to continue to decline over the long term, would give you a preference for long duration bonds. So, you know, 20, 30 year uh, bonds, which over the past 10, 15 years have done quite well. Uh, and since this cyclical peak in March have, have done quite well, I would expect that trend to continue. Uh, it would generally have you underweight commodities, although this uh, cyclical trend has been favorable to commodities, and it would have generally underweight equities. Or instead of underweight equities, you can shift your equity exposure towards those sectors that are more defensive, which in this environment tends to be you know, the large mega cap tech stocks. So the secular trend of the NASDAQ outperforming the Russell 2000, for example, would be a trend that I would expect to continue based on these longer term trends. Um, if we look at the cyclical trends, you know, if you if we were to uh, if we were to speak earlier in 2021, let's say in January, I had a view that cyclical uh, growth and inflation were, were going to increase then you would have wanted to pare back your bond exposure. You would have wanted to increase your equity exposure, increase your commodity exposure. Those have reversed. So we actually have a situation where the secular and cyclical trends are aligned, which makes the, the allocation process a little easier. So for me, that would put me on the longer duration bonds, and it would put me towards my more defensive equities. And I would be starting to reduce my commodity exposure in the midst of all of this hysteria and um, you know, if you want to have a trend-following strategy to play localized disruptions, that that's fine. But 
you know, you have to be very careful of the commodity complex because these rises that we're seeing are not broad based. You know, we see growth sensitive commodities like copper that are down seven or eight percent over the last six months, very correlated to that growth cycle. So that's sort of how I approach the portfolio allocation. Um, Bitcoin is not in the in that standard portfolio. Uh, investors, you know, I, I, I speak to clients that do add Bitcoin into that portfolio. Some investors like to think about it as an alternative to gold. Uh, I, I personally haven't studied uh, the factors that influence Bitcoin uh, very extensively. Uh, I, I, you know, perhaps wrongly uh, correlate uh, Bitcoin and some of the higher flying uh, stocks that we see in sort of the same speculative bucket, which which could all be barometers of you know, various liquidity conditions. So if you believe that uh, growth, as I do, growth is going to continue to decline, but you also believe that the Federal Reserve is going to, con- you know, going to reverse this QE taper and go back to more QE and larger QE, and we're going to continue to try this experiment of pushing more and more liquidity into the financial markets, you could continue to see, I guess, some of these speculative assets do quite well. But I would, you know, caveat that comment about Bitcoin is that I haven't, I haven't spent too much time on the, the nitty gritty details. I've done a little bit of work on the correlations of Bitcoin, and Bitcoin actually, uh, for the past eighteen months or so, has been pretty positively correlated to the S and P five hundred, and specifically to uh, inflation, steep yield curves, and economic growth. So Bitcoin trades a lot like, uh, you know. Uh, an oil stock or something. It's it's very interesting, which is different than what people typically associate it with. Uh, Eric, can can you quickly just explain um, why you prefer these sort of growth stocks uh, over over value and the uh, uh, mega cap versus small cap? Like in in the in macro environment that you envision, why are those assets going to do better? Yeah, it's a great question. It's sort of counterintuitive, right? Low growth or no growth? Why are you buying growth stocks? But that's just sort of the way that these indexes are labeled. Um, so the, the rationale behind that, and I understand that the, the equity portion of this is, is quite crowded, which is why that the, um, you know, my, my thesis also calls for, uh, long duration bonds, but essentially what it boils down to is as we move into an environment where growth declines, growth basically becomes more scarce. So if you find companies that have legitimate organic growth, that growth is going to trade at a premium when growth is scarce. Value stocks tend to be, you know, financials, energy, materials, industrials, and those sectors tend to be much more correlated to actual economic growth versus some of these mega cap tech stocks. You know, to name a few, we're looking at like Microsoft, Apple, Google, Facebook. The market perceives these companies to have very durable, non cyclical cash flows. So when growth comes down, the market doesn't think that their cash flows will deteriorate at all, and you just have a lower discount rate to to measure up against those long-term cash flows. But to put it simply, if growth is going to evaporate around the world, anyone who does have growth will trade at a premium because it's harder to find. And I believe that that trend will continue, although you know the the tech stocks do get quite crowded. There are big washouts. There are you know big rallies. It's, it's certainly a volatile place to be, but I would expect that long-term trend of NASDAQ to Russell to, to, to put one ratio in everyone's mind, I would expect that to, to continue. Mm. And what's your view on the equity market overall? Let's just say the, the S&P 500, because I'm thinking if you're uh, uh, very attracted to bonds at this moment, it must be that you don't really see a lot of upside in, in stocks because the upside in bonds, like if you own TLT, you know that thing, it might go up 40%, but yields would have to go negative for that to happen or something pretty close. Whereas for the, the S&P 500 to go up 40%, I mean, it's gone up over 100% over the past 18 months. So uh, the, the upside is, seems a bit capped uh, for TLT where it's uncapped on the S&P 500. So are you, you know, somewhat of a, of a bear or maybe getting less bullish uh, month over month? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I would say, you know, there are even longer duration instruments like, you know, there's ETF EDV, which has closer to a 25 year duration. And uh, when when bonds touched 1.79 uh, a couple of days ago, some of the longer duration stuff had rallied uh, over 20 percent in just six months. So some of the longer duration stuff does whip around quite a bit and you'd have you know, a pretty 
pretty massive move if you had long-term rates go anywhere close to zero. But, but to your point, the, the upside on equities is clearly uh, a lot larger if you believe that there's a zero floor. Uh, I, I do own equities. I'm not short equities. I don't actively short the S&P 500. I always have a long exposure. Uh, my exposure can be underweight. It can be overweight. Right now, I'm getting increasingly underweight my equity exposure. Uh, and I tend to get underweight equities when there's a cyclical downturn in growth, which we've been having since uh, March. And equities have done well. Bonds have also done well, so I haven't lost too much there. In fact, if you measure it against more of the cyclical indexes, bonds have done even better. Uh, but essentially, the, uh, the equity market to me is, uh, is, is going to trade mostly with growth. Uh, when growth's coming down, I want to be underweight equities. I'm not shorting any equities. Uh, and when I see growth uh, accelerating again, I would add back that equity exposure. Uh, so that's sort of the way that, that I think about it. I'm not uh, calling for a, a crash in equities. Uh, but when you marry a cyclical downturn in growth with a uh, tightening exercise from the Fed, if there's ever a time to create a risk pocket, that would be it. So uh, growth slowing in and of itself is a good time to uh, press the brakes on uh, huge equity exposure. Tightening monetary policy is another good time to pump the brakes. And when the two of them are happening together, that's sort of the most opportune time, in my view, to at least take an underweight stance. Uh, more aggressive people may try and short various sectors or things like that. But I'll go with underweight for now. Eric, you, you mentioned quantitative tightening by not just the Fed, which is now tapering its, its balance sheet, but uh, central banks that are actually raising rates, uh, Norway, Brazil, Australia. Uh, what do you think of the effect of this tightening of liquidity conditions will be on the market? You know, are, are there are a lot of folks who say quantitative easing doesn't really matter that much. You know, a, a trillion dollars of bank reserves here, a trillion dollars there. It actually isn't going into the real economy. So it, Q, if QE isn't super good for the economy, Q, QT not be super bad for the economy. Um, and also raising rates, which is uh, the thing that a lot of people actually think is important. Do you think that the Federal Reserve uh, will be forced to raise it because inflation is so high? It, it won't. What's your outlook and, and how is that going to impact asset markets? So I agree with your framing that quantitative easing uh, is certainly more impactful for financial markets than it is for the real economy. So um there, there is sort of a, a I would say, a perverse relationship when the economy gets extremely over indebted and monetary policy is pushed to its limits at the zero bound. Uh, it's called various things by you know, various studies, but liquidity trap is, is, is one of the, uh, the terms that's used. And basically what that means is the Federal Reserve um, can't ease. Adding liquidity to the system doesn't really do anything. It's pushing on a string. But tightening, you could always tighten. So you can't ease, but you can tighten. Uh, I, I do expect the initial round of this tightening uh, to, to impact uh, you know, financial market liquidity more so than the economy. I don't expect the, the real economy to, to go into a, a tailspin because they're reducing the pace of their, their purchases. But if we look at this from, from an economic lens, uh, basically we have... Nominal GDP is equal to money supply times velocity. Most people are aware of that, despite people not liking the concept of velocity. But if we focus on the money supply, the money supply is equal to the monetary base times the money multiplier. The monetary base is what the Federal Reserve controls. And by slowing the rate of their purchases, they're going to be slowing the rate of growth in the monetary base. The Federal Reserve cannot control the money multiplier which is the rate at which the monetary base translates into broad M2. There was a recent paper uh, that was just published on the various factors that influence that money multiplier. Things, uh, three, three factors stand out from that paper, which is consumers' willingness to borrow or you know, aggregate debt levels, banks' willingness to lend, and regulations. So regulations would be hindering that ratio and then you know, private sector indebtedness would be hindering that as well. So even if the Federal Reserve tries to, to tighten, they're not going to get much of a lift from that money multiplier. So what does that mean? It means that if they try and shrink the growth rate in the monetary base, they're going to shrink the growth rate in the money supply. Why is that important? Money supply times velocity is nominal GDP. 
A lot of people don't like velocity, but if we look at the chart of velocity, there's been very, very few increases at all over the last 20, 25 years. There's been maybe a quarter up and then right back down, two quarters up and right back down. The secular trends impacting velocity are extremely strong. Similar factors that, that are influencing that demographics and debt. So what this all means is if the Federal Reserve is going to reduce the growth rate in the M2 money supply, and you're not going to get a counteracting lift in velocity, then nominal GDP growth is going to come down over time. That's not something that I expect to happen You know, the first day they start the tapering exercise, but if they do carry this through the middle of next year, which I think consensus believes, they will engineer a pretty serious decline in the growth rate of the money supply, and that will have an impact uh, to the economy at that point. Uh, I think it's questionable whether they get that far or not. You know, we have pretty serious flattening of the yield curve in the back end uh, without them raising rates or even starting the program yet. So we'll see if they get started. They're going to they're gonna do 15 billion reduction in November. They're going to do another 15 billion in December. Then they left it open-ended after that. Uh, I think if we continue to see the yield curve flatten further, uh, they're going to be in a tough situation where they're going to have to sort of, uh, they're going to sort of have to pick, are they going to keep going with tightening invert the yield curve and risk a recession, or are they going to try and combat uh, inflation, even though the tools at their disposal won't really be able to get at the heart of these price pressures. And Eric, what have you made of the flattening of the yield curve? We've mentioned that uh, the yields on the long end have declined, but at the same time, yields on the short end have risen, perhaps in expectation that the Federal Reserve will uh, raise rates and as many as two rate hikes are actually priced in for 2022. Will the Fed raise rates? Can the market handle it? So they, they may be able to raise rates a couple of times. Uh, I don't think that they'll be able to raise rates as high as the belly of the curve is pricing. So we see like five year rates at 1.25%. And what's interesting about uh, the short term rates rising is that does have an economic impact as soon as those rates rise. So we don't need to wait for the Fed to actually raise the Fed funds rate to start seeing the tightening impact in the economy. You know, as soon as rates started to back up, we saw mortgage rates back up. That has an immediate economic impact. Any debt security that's priced off of the five-year point in the curve has seen basically a 80 basis point jump. That's the equivalent of like three rate hikes. So when the short-term interest rates rise, that does have an immediate economic impact. That starts the process of restraining economic growth right away. Can the economy chug through that? That remains to be seen. Based on the structural trends, I would argue no. And as long as the cyclical trends continue to the downside, I would argue no again. If the economy has a reacceleration in growth, then the Federal Reserve may be able to get rate hikes in. And I would point to the 2017 uh, period. The U.S. economy was on relatively decent footing. The structural trends were the same, but most of the reason, in my view, why the Federal Reserve was able to get away with rate hikes is because in late 2015, China reflated the world economy in a massive way, um, which caused growth to accelerate around the world, mainly through the production channel, which is an extremely important cycle, the industrial production cycle. So we had uh, rapidly rising growth in China, and in most countries around the world, most of the manufacturing centers around the world through 2016 through, uh, through 2017, that allowed the Fed to raise rates. It kind of reflated commodity prices. And then once that impulse from China started to fade, a lot of people attributed it to the trade war, but the, the, the decline was already in place before the trade war started. As soon as that impulse from China started to fade, we saw the disinflationary impact started to ripple through commodity prices and the Federal Reserve had to start cutting interest rates. So without that major tailwind from China, it's going to be very difficult to repeat the tightening cycle of 2017. And in fact, China may be going in the other direction based on some of the uh, property uh, issues that they're having, which is the sector that did reflate the global economy the last time. So. They may hit the gas and try and reflate it one more time, but it does seem like they're having some problems there, which may cause them to deleverage that sector, which would uh, put another disinflationary force through, uh, through the global economy, mainly through the commodity channel.
Eric, what do you see in terms of an end game? A lot of what you've said uh, is similar to uh, the theory of the, the long-term debt cycle and, and the work of Ray Dalio, Lynn, Lynn Alden, and, and the like. And the theory is that oh, once debt levels are so high, there must be a deleveraging, and that can happen by a default, by wealth redistribution, uh, or, or by inflation. Uh, do, you, do you think we are uh, in a long-term debt cycle? Do you think we are nearing the end of a long-term debt cycle? And what are the ways out? I take it not inflation, because I know you are definitely not an inflationist. Yeah, I, I respect the work of, of Ray Dalio, obviously, and, and Lynn Alden. I've spoken to her several times. Um, I love the work that she puts out. I, I disagree on inflation as a solution for a couple of reasons. One is the research to me is clear that there hasn't been any major economies that have been able to solve a debt problem through inflation because major economies will provoke retaliation from trading partners. If a very small island country that has, you know, a tenth of a share of global GDP devalues their currency by 70%, no one's really going to care. And they'll be able to, you know, cheapen their, their uh, tourism and, and, and various things like that. Uh, there, if the U.S. tried to devalue their currency, we would probably see a retaliation from other developed economies that are in a similar situation. And throughout all of this uh, quantitative easing, fiscal spending, the dollar has remained relatively strong and is basically at the same level that it was before all of this started. So the currency hasn't cheapened all that much and gold prices haven't really risen that much uh, as well, which would, which would cut against the inflation thesis. The second point that I would make is that uh, most of the future debt burden that we have is through the entitlement programs, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. All of those entitlement programs are implicitly or explicitly linked to inflation. So Social Security this year, it was a headline, got a 6% cost of living adjustment. So if you run the inflation rate at 6% for five years straight, you're just going to increase your spending by 6% for five years straight. So it gets very difficult to inflate your way out of debt when most of your debt burden is linked to inflation. The 1940s is a different scenario because the transfer payments as a percentage of total income, uh, if I remember the numbers correctly, was only about 2% compared to over 30% today. So this transfer payments and this, this link to inflation was not present then as it is today. The second thing that's different about the 1940s scenario the reason that the, the debt to GDP ratio came down was not because of inflation, it was because net national savings increased. The only way to get debt levels down is through an increase in net national savings. Net national savings rose to 16% in the 1940s. It's only 2% today. So what that means is net national savings is the accumulation of, of government savings, private sector savings, household savings, foreign savings. So one of, the, one of the dirty secrets about the World War II period was, yes, the government was spending a lot of money, but the private sector was saving more than the government was dissaving. Private sector savings rose as high as 25% and was, and was elevated for three, four, five years. We saw the savings rate in the United States spike, but it's right back to where it was before COVID. It's back down to 7%. So we're not having any sustained private sector savings to offset the government dissavings. As a result, the net national savings rate's coming down. It's not rising, which is totally opposite from what was happening in the 1940s. Can you just elaborate a little more on, on why you think that the 1940s isn't a good analog? Is it, and we're straying from economics, but is it because there was a war and now there's no reason to run uh, such uh, persistently large current account deficits? Or, or is it something else? Sure. So another difference is that we were actually running a trade surplus at that time where we're running a deficit now. Um, so there are huge differences to the 1940 scenario, which to me make the situation not applicable other than the government was spending a lot of money at the time. So net national savings, to your point, is if the government sector is, gonna, is not going to save or they're going to spend and the private sector is not going to cover that, that, uh, that spending, then yes, the trade deficit will rise. And that has a negative economic consequence because if the trade deficit rises, we're going to export most of our manufacturing jobs and our production jobs to other countries, which is going to put downward pressure on the employment to population ratio. So that ratio is going to continue to grind down. It's going to, again, put more people out of the labor force. So the, uh, so the net national savings rate has to rise for debt to GDP to come down. The net national savings rate could rise in various different ways. It could come in the form of household savings. It can come in the form of uh, corporate savings, or it can come in the form of the government running a smaller deficit. So 
Where I see this playing out is if we continue on the path that we're continuing on, which is essentially we're not willing to sacrifice government spending and we're not willing to sacrifice consumption. So what has to happen is the trade deficit will have to continue to rise, which means we'll lose more jobs, or private domestic investment will have to fall. Private domestic investment, however, is the most important uh, component for long-term productivity. And we've seen the rate of, of private domestic investment in structures and equipment fall from about 8% of GDP in the 1980s to just 2% of GDP today. That's things like power plants, hospitals, airports, um, you know, all of the main uh, parts of the economy that generate long-term productivity gains. You think about, you know, in California, every time the wind blows, the power goes out. In Texas, we had a cold winter, the power grid froze, people couldn't go to work for two weeks. That compounds negatively for productivity and the less you invest in structures and equipment, the less you invest in the production side of the economy, the more the economy runs on consumption and there's no productivity enhancements from consumption. It's just, did you consume more than you did the last year? And for that, you either need lower interest rates or more income. Eric, I want to ask you a, a counterfactual, factional, which is what would have to happen for there to be inflation in the U.S.? And let's say you and I were a, were a team and you're the chairman of the Federal Reserve and I'm the president and you and I are both on the same page. We said we want to create inflation no matter what. Would we be able to do it in your view? The, the real uh, inflationary time bomb would be the Fed now accounts that, that or the or the digital currencies that are being discussed. And the reason to me that that would be uh, the time bomb is because right now we're we're giving people money and we're sending people checks and it's all debt financed. If you do these Fed now accounts, you can theoretically, you know, well, you'd have to sort of you'd have to change the, the, the rules of the game, but you could sort of credit people's accounts and give people money without a corresponding increase in debt. That would be different. The other reason it's different, though, is because now you're entering two competing currencies into the same economy. And this is why it's very akin to uh, uh, the ancient empires like punching holes in the coins. You know, they, they told you that both coins were worth the same, but you knew that one coin was worth less than the other one. So if you had a currency that was perceived to have less value, you would be willing to trade it for anything because you'd want to get rid of it. And that causes the velocity of money to start to rise. So if we were in a scenario where the central banks created a Fed Now account and they were able to deposit you know, Fed dollars into your account, Jack, you're getting paid you know, US dollars from BlockWorks and then you have Fed dollars from the Fed, they can tell you that both currencies have the same value, but as a society, whatever currency is perceived to have less value will start to circulate very quickly as people try and trade that less valuable currency for things that they believe have more lasting value. That would be the, the catalyst to get velocity to really start to pick up. And then you have rising money supply and rising velocity, and there you go. Right now, we're sending people checks. You know, For example, if you have a, if you have a grandmother, I have a grandmother, she, uh, she gets a, a, a social security check. She doesn't even spend the whole social security check because her rate of consumption is so low that the social security check goes right into her bank and then it either sits as a bank deposit or goes back into financial assets. And if we were to send that cohort of people more fiscal stimulus checks, then the same thing would happen. It would end up just working its way into the financial markets. If you uh, started giving people currencies that were perceived to have less value, now we'd be changing the game and you'd be wanting to trade away those currencies for things that have uh, more value. So that to me would be how you could create inflation in a heartbeat would be put a currency in the economy that has less value than the other one. Eric, it's fascinating. A little correction is I actually don't work at BlockWorks. I am the president of the United States. Uh, and <laughs> you right. are the, you, you're the chairman of the Federal Reserve. So yeah, be, be careful what happens yeah. in your personal account, you know, because you don't want any, uh, you know, yeah, I don't want any Fed dollars. Yeah. Cast aspersions. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, all, all kidding aside, Eric, I, my, my final question for you is, to what degree do you buy the argument that if the Treasury is issuing bonds uh, that are yielding significantly less than inflation, you know, like we have now, the, the, the 30 year is at what, 1.9%. Meanwhile, inflation is at 6.2% inflation, 6.2%. And the Fed through quantitative easing is buying those bonds. QE by itself is an inflationary, but when it's buying bonds that are in a sense uneconomical, that that actually is inflationary. 
uh, I take it that you don't agree with that. Can you can you explain why? So the question you're asking is is the combination of fiscal spending and QE inflationary, right? Is that, yes. is that the basic yeah, the merging. The question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The merging. So the merging again, it can cause a short term boost to inflation if you know they like they did during COVID. They sent out uh, tons of money, but in my opinion. The, the you know, so we, we, we did quantitative easing for the last you know 10, 12 years. It didn't cause inflation. What's different now? Okay, we did we we did enough fiscal spending is what people would say. I would I would characterize it differently. A lot of the reason we had inflation is because of these bottlenecks, not necessarily because of the aggregate amount of dollars that were being spent. If you look at the rate of total consumption in the economy and you plot it against the pre-COVID trend line. Total consumption is exactly on that pre-COVID trend line. It dropped sharply, it rose sharply, and it's no higher than it was before COVID. What's different is we pulled forward like three or four years worth of durable goods consumption. So if you look at the trend of durable goods consumption, that spiked way above the trend line. And that to me was more a function of a behavioral shift than it was people getting several thousand dollars in their account. So forcing people to stay home, not allowing them to consume services like restaurants and movie theaters, everyone had to work from home, they had to buy desks, they had to buy chairs, they had to buy computers. That's all durable goods. That all creates manufacturing. That all you know creates the bottlenecks. If people aren't working, the supply chains are global. So there, and then we also had people moving from cities to suburbs. That caused people to buy new houses, buy new cars, furnish the houses. That had a very big inflationary impact as well. I think it's difficult to argue that people moved from cities to suburbs because of three or four thousand dollars. I think it was a behavioral shift because of a, a new paradigm. People didn't want to be in cities anymore. They wanted more open space. So, you know, a counterfactual would be if the economy was wide open, if COVID never happened and we dumped three thousand dollars on everyone, would we have had the same impact that we're having today? I would argue strongly no. But to your point, I would say that we would have a small rise while the money entered the economy, people would consume it, and then we'd have a fleeting benefit. And then what ends up happening is when you merge the two, you're increasing the government's control in the economy. So the government is becoming a larger and larger player in the economy, which means the private sector is becoming a smaller and smaller share of the economy. And we have really good academic research to suggest that as government spending or government however you want to define it, government rises or government grows larger, that reduces real economic growth. The best studies suggest that every 10 percentage point increase in government size tends to reduce real growth by about uh, 0.5 to 1%. So to put numbers on this, in the 1960s, the long-term rate of real growth in the economy was about 3%, and government spending as a percentage of GDP was about 20%. Uh, it rose to almost 60% in COVID. It's come down to about 40% now. So that's a 20 percentage point increase in government size. The research would suggest that we should expect a 1% to 2% decline in real in our trend real growth. And if we look at the last uh, 12 years in a chart that I uh, showed, real GDP per capita, it's about 1.6%. So we've lost one and a half percentage points of that trend very consistent with the research. So to me, the merging of Treasury and Fed, as long as they're not uh, creating the Fed now accounts and bypassing, you know, increasing money without corresponding increase in debt, all that will do is it will increase the government's share of the economy. It will create shorter term boosts, but it will create a longer term drag. Yeah, and that, uh, that argument about durable inf goods inflation being transitory does make sense. People are moving to the suburb, they're buying a tractor, they're buying a washing machine. That is not going to last forever. But as you noted, durable goods is something about 10% of CPI, whereas what is a huge percentage is uh, shelter, uh, which comprises of rent as well as owner equivalent rent, which is sort of to uh, you know, attach uh, the, the rise in the uh, price of housing to inflation, but not housing as an asset, has to, uh, uh, housing as a, a consumable good. Uh, there's been a lot of work, uh, a lot of economists, investors, as well as the uh, Federal Reserve uh, Bank of Dallas, who put out a paper on this, associating uh, uh, the rise in the price of housing with the rise in owner equivalent rent in as a percentage of CPI. 
Um, and the pr rise of housing, if you just look at the case Shiller, it has exploded higher. And this would suggest that we could expect over the next 12 months or so, uh, owner equivalent rent to be very high in CPI, which would be an extremely uh, uh, upward force on the consumer price index. Uh, to what degree do you uh, not disagree? To what degree do you uh, agree with this or not? Okay, so the durable goods inflation, like you mentioned, won't last forever. Um, it's unclear how long it will, you know, which month it will start to come down. But like you said, we pulled forward so much of this durable goods spending. Durable goods is a category that's uh, subject to what we call pent up demand. And when pent up demand is exhausted, meaning like you, you buy a house, you don't need to buy four ovens and seven refrigerators. After you buy one, you don't need one and you technically don't need one for quite some time after that. So we will see a hangover in this durable goods consumption at some point. Hard to say exactly when. So it's not an unreasonable expectation to see durable goods uh, to go back into deflation just because of the, the, the rate of change. But let's just say that it goes back to zero. We have durable goods inflation that was rising at a 20% annualized rate fall to zero at a 10% weighting in the CPI. And then based on the Atlanta Fed, we could expect rent inflation to rise maybe to 7%, 7.5%. So you have uh, rent inflation today going from 3% to 7 uh, at a 30% weighting. So when you equate those two, there, there is certainly going to be an offset. If, if we, you know, rent inflation is going to rise over the next several months because we already have the home prices. If the durable goods inflation stays higher for longer, then the CPI will hover at a higher level for longer. But uh, the way that I see it is whenever these durable goods inflation uh, correct, which is going to be extremely correlated to the supply chains alleviating, then we're going to see the peak in overall inflation. I think durable goods is really going to be the swing factor just because of how volatile the category is, even though it's 10% versus 30%. The other point that I would make on rent inflation is that if home prices rise 25%, let's say, rent doesn't have to rise 25%. During COVID, we pushed interest rates down. We pushed the rate of return on assets down. So if you know you used to buy a single family home, rent it out, and maybe make an 8% rate of return, it's pretty realistic to expect that your rate of return on that asset would be compressed. Maybe let's call it 4%. So you could get home prices rising you know, 20% and rent rising 10%, let's say. So you know, rising, but not rising as much of the home price and basically just the rate of return on your rental coming down. So I would expect that as well. But yes, rent inflation will rise. It will have an upward impact on the CPI, but we really have to watch durable goods. I mean, if used car prices continue to rise and, and, and those durables continue to rise, then yes, inflation will stay at a higher level, but then real income will, will get hit even harder. So I think that durables is going to be the swing factor more than rent, even though it's a larger percentage of the overall basket. Brilliant. Well, Eric, thank you so much for being so generous with your time and insights. Uh, I definitely recommend everyone watching this to uh, follow Eric at uh, EPB Research um, and also your, your service, uh, EPB Macro Research. I, I can link to a few blog uh, posts, which, which I w we referenced um, during this talk in the description. Eric, Eric, thank you so much. Thanks, Jack. I appreciate it.